God deals directly with people. And that now he uses his covenants to deal with us. What in the world is a covenant? Well, we'll talk about that and more. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ron Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. Now in just a few minutes, about three minutes, we're going to talk about Deuteronomy chapter 29. It's very interesting as Moses writes through the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's talk about it. It's going to be good. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey? I'm looking at weights, measures, balances, gold, silver, lots of good stuff. <laughs> Ryan? Well, today I'm talking about the importance of blood, both physically and spiritually. Very interesting. Physically and spiritually. Fascinating. Okay. Janice? Well, you know, it's Friday again. Oh, and remember those balloons that Amy and Ben gave me with the confetti inside? Oh, yeah. I feel like I should have had one here today. Glad to you know. It. Yep. It, well, it is a little messy, but it's okay. <laughs> Our Friday wrap-up question of the week, anywhere from Deuteronomy 4 through 31. Get ready. Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 9. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants, and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs, and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear, to this very day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sion king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh. Therefore keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 1 through 9. We're coming up on the end of Deuteronomy, and it is really something. Now, Moses has been writing all of this after Israel has completed uh, walking through the wilderness and going through all of that. And the Holy Spirit is using him to communicate to us. And today we look at chapter 29. And this is interesting. Deuteronomy 29 records a covenant that God made with Israel while they were in Moab. What's a covenant? Well, when you think in English dictionaries, it will give a definition that speaks about an agreement or a promise or a formal contract between peoples or groups. However, in the ancient culture that Israel was a part of, covenants were very meaningful and binding on the parties. In Israel's case, this covenant was all the more important because it was made with God. God himself, who certainly had the authority and the power to enforce the covenant. This covenant in our reading today was a renewal with his new generation of Israelites. Now, they were the generation that was going to take the promised land and establish a nation there. That's really interesting to see how God continued to speak with the generations of Israel and will continue in different ways as their story unfolds in the Bible. Through these interactions, we can see how God works in the world. God's promises are real. And by the way, so are his conditions. This is very interesting. God's promises are real, and so are his conditions, and they're just as real today. Because God is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. Now take your Bible guide and uh, turn to the passage today as we study this. It's going to be very interesting. And uh, as we do, you can write to us or call us and get a Bible guide that way or go to Bible Discovery TV and click on the page. When you click on the page, we'll send it to you. It's very, very good. Now, it's important that we pray and ask God to help us understand the covenant and help us to understand what he's saying here. Father, we pray today that you would speak to our hearts and ready us to read the scripture because these words are from your Holy Spirit and we need to hear you. So help us to understand what you're saying. So Holy Spirit, we submit to you now. We don't want to put our ideas into this. So whatever we've learned and however we've learned it, Lord, your Holy Spirit has the right to overtake it. So in Jesus' name, this is what we pray. We said together, amen. Now, with that in mind, we come to the first verse. It says, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses, God commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the co- besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. That's very interesting. God deals directly with the people in this world. The covenants of God are relevant to us through our obedience to him. I guess the best way to say this is that generation where the covenant is made at Horeb, that's one generation. This generation where the covenant is made in Moab is another generation. God deals with every generation specifically. And he deals with our generation today. And he has said to people, if you call on my name, I will help you and I will rescue you from the ravages of hell. Jesus Christ said that. And we need to pay attention to that because he's still active today and his Holy Spirit is ready to do that. Now with that in mind, we go to verse 2. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to the Pharaoh and to all of the servants and to all of his land, the great trials, which your eyes have seen the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. In fact, your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink that you may know that I am the Lord, your God. This is important. God's provision for us is not always seen by those who do not know him. We trust in the Lord who gives us all that we need when we need it. All that we need when we need it. Now, God's provision works in China just as much as it works in India, just as much as it works in Nigeria, just as much as it works in South Africa, just as much as it works in North America. He gives us what we need when we need it, not what we want. You know, our wants are not our needs. But God gives us what we need. We are in that time today when we don't have time to play around. We have to get serious with God. And and part of getting serious with God is recognizing God supplies our needs. So we need to pay attention to that. Now, let's go on to this last verse, a couple of verses. This is really great. And when you come to this place, Sihon, or rather the king of Heshbon and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Therefore... Keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. Now, this is really important. Listen carefully. When we follow the Lord, he leads us. When we follow the Lord, 
The Lord leads us. When we do not, we fail. <laughs> now, Christians know to follow the Lord Jesus Christ all our lives because this is critical. Let me tell you something. It is very, very critical. I've been times in my life when I felt like, yes, I'm doing the Lord's will. I'm doing the Lord's will. I'm doing it. Yes, I'm doing I wasn't. I wasn't following God. He wasn't leading. That became a problem because I fell. But God is always forgiving. God is always graceful. And let me tell you something. He came back to me and he said, are you ready now? I said, yes, I'm ready. I've got a lot of scars on my back from doing that. And let me tell you something. If we focus and pray about our decisions and pray, Lord, help me to make the right decisions in the right place at the right time following you, then God will lead us. And so, Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that we would all come to you and say, Lord, forgive me where we've sinned. Forgive us. Help us to make the right decisions as we go forward. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is what we pray. And all of us said together, amen. Now, as we make those decisions, God speaks in different ways. But God will speak to us. So let's listen. Let's hear God. He's talking all the time, but do we really hear him? Let's listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so as I mentioned off the top of the program, today I'm talking about the importance of blood, both physically and spiritually. Now, modern medical science has taught us the critical role that blood plays in living organisms. But was this modern discovery really so modern? Well, believe it or not, the Bible, which was written thousands of years before modern medical science, teaches this same biological truth, plus more. Check it out. One of the most powerful evidences that the Bible is divinely inspired is its scientific accuracy. As Dr. Henry Morris wrote, there are many unexpected scientific truths that have lain hidden within its pages for thousands of years, only to be recognized and appreciated in recent times. These principles are not expressed in modern technical jargon, of course, but nevertheless are presented accurately and beautifully, indicating remarkable understanding of nature by these ancient authors far in advance of their discovery by modern scientists. One example of this foreknowledge is regarding the importance of blood and the critical role it plays in biological organisms. Leviticus 17.11, for example, declares that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Interestingly, it wasn't until 1616 that the English physician William Harvey fully described the properties of blood and how it circulates through the body. Modern science now acknowledges and understands that the life of the flesh quite literally is in the blood, as it transmits the very breath of life by carrying the oxygen from the lungs throughout the body to all its cells. The fact that the Bible revealed the importance of blood many millennia before scientists fully described and elaborated on it truly is a wonderful testimony that it is not the mere product of men, but is inspired by the Creator God Himself. However, God's primary concern is not to give us a biology lesson, but rather to teach a more important spiritual truth. As Leviticus 17.11 and similar passages goes on to explain, Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Because, as Romans 6.23 explains, the wages, that is the cost or the price of sin, is death. And since the life is in the blood, then without shedding of the lifeblood, there is no remission of sin. So the cost for sin, even just one sin, is nothing short of our life. However, not wanting us to perish, God in his love instituted substitutionary sacrifice in which he would accept one life in place of another. This began with animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, but was ultimately fulfilled by God himself who gave his own lifeblood in place of ours 
on the cross through the God-man, Jesus Christ, the sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world for whoever believes. Jesus Christ is the only solution to our sin problem, which the Bible describes as a spiritual and as a terminal disease. And this important spiritual truth is again paralleled by a physical biological truth, because the blood, which is the channel of life, becomes also the carrier of disease and infection through the body when they gain the upper hand in the system. Physical life and death symbolize spiritual life and death, just as physical disease and injury symbolize the spiritual disease of sin. As the infection of sin spreads throughout the soul, it will eventually, when it's finished, bring forth death. And this is spiritual death, eternal separation from God in hell. If spiritual life is to be created and maintained, it must come from outside. It must be life untainted with sin and containing the power to combat the sin disease in the spiritually dying soul. Figuratively speaking, a blood transfusion is essential from a qualified donor whose blood possesses the purity and efficacy required for the cleansing and healing of the mortally sin-sick soul. And that qualified donor is none other than Jesus Christ. So it wasn't until rather recently that medical science discovered the critical role that blood plays in living things. But the Bible, written thousands of years ago, taught that the life of the flesh is in the blood. It also teaches that that's why blood sacrifice was necessary for the remission of sins. It was life for life. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. He died in our place. It was his lifeblood in place of ours. So now anyone who trusts and believes in and on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Because he rose from the dead, so will we. Now, just FYI, there's more to this segment, but I had to cut it down due to time constraints on TV. But I have posted the full version to my YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and type in my name and you'll find me. Yeah, Ryan Hembry, or Ryan Hembry is very, very important at... Uh YouTube. It's very interesting. And uh, as we do that, keep in mind, Corey is also on YouTube. But Corey, go ahead. All right. Well, today I want to talk about payment methods used by ancient Israel. They're systems of commerce. Now, a lot of us will instantly associate ancient commerce with coins, right? Ancient coins are a pretty popular collector's item now. Even I was gifted a very cool 4th century AD coin for Christmas one year. But, 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 when we actually look at history, coins didn't come into usage until the 6th century BC, which is the century when Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And even then, coins were used pretty sporadically until their full acceptance in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, the time of the Persian Empire in that region. Now, recently, on January 17th, 2024, there was a discovery announced by the IAA of a 6th century silver coin found in the ruins of an Israelite four-room house in what would have been rural Judah, the countryside. Uh, the coin is quite rare in Israel. There's only a few of them that have been found, and it's so far the earliest coin ever found in Israel. It belongs to a known group of coins that was minted in either Greece, Cyprus, or Turkey, and this coin in particular had actually been cut in half in antiquity, showing that coins weren't universally accepted as payment yet, and the people had to cut the silver coin to an appropriate weight or quantity that was accepted as payment. Now, this brings us to Israel's earlier system of commerce before coinage, which was payment via weights of silver and other types of precious metals. We see these weights of metals being mentioned in Genesis 24, for example, when Abraham's servant gives specifically weighted jewelry to Rebecca. See, jewelry was made using specific weights of gold and silver because then they could be easily used as payment. Now, we also have weights and measures mentioned later in the Bible. For example, Leviticus 19 verses 35 and 36 says, you shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
So that tells us a few things. First, that people could cheat. They could mislabel their weights. They could tip their scales to make a higher and more dishonest profit. And actually, there has been a cheater weight discovered from ancient Jerusalem. So someone was breaking the law. But these verses also reinforce that Israel's commerce did indeed use weights, balances, and liquid measures for their goods to ensure that people were getting fairly compensated. And archaeology has upheld this conclusion. It's apparently quite common for excavators to find stone weights in their digs. There are many shekel weights, two shekel weights and lighter weights available as examples. Now, a few noteworthy marketplaces have also been excavated. One of them was in Eshkelon, which is actually a city named after the standard weight, a shekel. Its excavated marketplace was preserved thanks to the Babylonian destruction in the 6th century BC by Nebuchadnezzar. And the evidence points to this being a marketplace where precious metals would have been the main form of payment because there was nowhere for the stores or the stalls to keep traded goods, so metals it was. Now, a second temple market in Jerusalem near to the Temple Mount has also been excavated. And though coins would have been the main form of payment here because of the time period, Weights and balances were still utilized to measure out dry goods, as is evidenced by all of the stone weights that had been found. Now, excitingly, a measurement table for liquids was also excavated. Now, this bumps up the number of similar measurement tables that have been found to three. Now, the table had a carved indentation or funnel into it with a small hole at its bottom. Now, a finger would block the hole and the liquid would be poured into the indentation to get the proper measurement. And then the hole could be released and the liquid would be caught in another jar underneath the table. This is fascinating because it brings a whole lot of sense to when you're reading in the scripture, it says, according to the sanctuary shekel. Yep. What does that mean? That means that the, the temple itself had a measurement that they used and you did your measurement according to that. Definitely, and it's really interesting to go into some of these archeological uh, papers that like the, 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 um, uh, the release papers that the archaeologists, the excavators, uh, they write them all down because they'll measure the weights. And so you get to see what the standard uh, uh, shekel was, you know, back in the Iron Age, back in the time period of the kings of Israel versus during the Second Temple period when Christ was around and then being able to see all the different measurements that they use. It's really interesting. Uh, and even like later on when coins do come into practice, we see in some periods, in some later periods, the temple uh, or Jerusalem minting its own coinage uh, and having its own type of coin exclusively, like it would, ex for, for a while during the time of Jesus, it exclusively accepted the uh, the Tyrrhenian shekel. So uh, silver coins minted from Tyre, which is really interesting. And then later on, it, it minted its own. That's amazing. While. <laughs> yeah. And, and there, but there was a difference between the ancient times and then the New Testament times. A difference? Yes. Uh, minimal, but still there, yes. I, I find that absolutely fascinating because that's really interesting. The, the, the scripture tells us, and the question is, I mean, gravity, you know, is there, but the question is, uh, what what does all of this mean? And God will tell us when we get to the, we get to heaven, we get a couple of things we'll ask him is, you know, what, what is the measurements now, you know, because it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And if you're interested in knowing some of the, like the, like the equivalent weights, um, I, I have a couple videos on my YouTube channel right now, a couple shorts where I measured out using my kitchen scale, what an ancient shekel weighed. And I think, I think a, an iron age shekel was about, um, Oh no, I'm going to get it wrong now. I think it was 31 raisins. <laughs> Something like that. I just use standard stuff around That's a lot of raisins, house. yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, like, good handful for a snack, I noticed. But yeah, if you're interested in that, you can check it out. And how do they check that out? How do they find it? Oh, just on my YouTube channel, Corey Babetchko. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Now, you do a weekend program? Yep. Same place, YouTube channel with Matt Locke, my husband. Uh, we we released the show on Friday, so you can watch it whenever you want to over the weekend uh, is the idea. And we talk about big issues that pop up as we're reading through the scripture. And we also take viewer questions and comments, and we discuss those as well. All right, very good. Look forward to Lots that. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. The Lots question stuff. is here. More stuff. I'm going to be still, but All go right. ahead with okay. the question. All right. So again, 
It's anywhere from our reading from last week up until today, from Deuteronomy 4 through to 31. Here it comes. In the Passover review, given in Deuteronomy, only unleavened bread can be eaten with the sacrifice. And for how many days? Five, seven, or nine? Five, seven, or nine. I've got mm -hmm. time. I'm going to read the question again. I know some Sitting of you on guys, my hands. I can almost hear Bible leaves flapping through. Because <laughs> they in can the use Passover, the That's right. In the Passover review given in Deuteronomy, only unleavened bread can be eaten with the sacrifice. And for how many days? Five, seven, or nine? What do you yeah. think? We're pretty confident on this one. Pretty confident. Yes. yes. Confident that it is seven days. All right. Well, you at home. What did you answer today? Let's see. We're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. So... If you said seven days, you're absolutely right. Congratulations. Look and, at my hands. Oh, who are you giving the numbers as secret? They didn't see it until afterwards, <laughs> but I had my hands down. <laughs> you still like to play along. Well, yeah. Anyway, and if you didn't get the answer right, that's okay. Just wait again until next Friday and we'll have it all over again. You know, it is really good. I've been doing this for the past couple of days. I'll do it for a few more days, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who has given to this ministry and continues to give. We understand that your giving is because you love the Lord and we are reading the Bible together, you and I, as we go through this and our family. This is awesome to go through the Word of God. So Father, we pray today that you would help people to get their needs met and help them at this time. It's very important. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.